Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the session. My name is Mustafa. I'm co-founder of DeepMind. And this morning, I want to tell you a little bit about the work that we've been doing to use machine learning and AI to tackle climate change. So you may be familiar with our mission. Um, our mission is to try to solve intelligence. And the core motivation that led us to set up this mission when we started the company in 2010 was to try to address the key question, what if we could distill what makes us unique and exceptional as a species, our minds, our intelligences, our capacity to be creative, to plan over long-term sequences, to have really incredible intuition for discovering insight in complex social systems. What if we could extract the essence of that into an algorithmic construct? Wouldn't it be incredible if we could use that and take advantage of parallel compute, access to vast amounts of training data, and use it to do really important uh, things in the world? And so that was the motivation that led us to architect solving intelligence as our core mission. And I think what's at stake in the world is that many of our most challenging problems are actually intractably complex, from science to macroeconomics to weather modeling. We're overwhelmed by the complexity of the systems around us. We've got tons and tons of data, but trying to extract insight from that data and learn the relationship between cause and effect well enough to be able to make meaningful predictions in these environments is becoming more and more challenging. So the key question is, what if we were able to use the sorts of systems that we've been developing and try and extract new insight, but actually use that to turn insight into real action, to actually affect these stuck social challenges? That was our core motivation. We really need new tools, new tools that humans control, that we design, um, to try and help us to make sense of the complexity of the world around us. And we began quite a few years ago now on the old school challenge of Atari. Our first major breakthrough came in 2015. For those of you who don't know, I'm sure everyone does, the, the Atari uh, set of games was the sort of 100 or so environments from around the 80s and 90s, many of which you'll be familiar with from uh, uh, Pong uh, to Space Invaders. And the challenge for us is, could we actually take just the raw environment, provide purely the pixels as inputs, and give them to an agent that isn't told anything about what they could do, isn't given any prior knowledge, no heuristics, everything the agent should learn purely from scratch. And all we provide is simply the goal. In this case, the optimization target was score. Could a single agent learn to play all of these games to human level performance or even above simply through correlating score and a rewarding outcome with the preceding state that had taken place over the past interactions that it had had playing the game. And so the key intuition here is imagine um, a robot standing in an arcade with no sense of what's actually going on behind the scenes, no additional information, but just controlling the joystick and looking at the screen. So here's a little video to show you what it was like when we first set our agent to play in this environment. You can see it's randomly moving left and right to control the paddle at the bottom. And most of the time, it's completely missing um, any of the bricks at all. After 300 or so games, the agent seems to learn this correlation between score going up and moving the paddle preemptively to the right place to tap the ball into the blocks. But what was really interesting, after about 500 or so games, really unexpectedly and very surprising to many of us engineers, was that it discovered a strategy of tunneling. If it could just pummel the ball up the back, it could get maximum score with minimum effort. And this is really interesting, because it was actually the first time that we got really concrete intuition that we were onto something. Nothing in the system had been pre-programmed. There were no heuristics. None of the engineers were able to hand code little tricks like this one. But purely through self-play, the system discovered new knowledge. And that is the core quest of DeepMind. How can we discover new insights and new knowledge? We extended this a few years later to tackle the ancient game of Go. The incredible thing about the game of Go 
is that enormous complexity arises from very, very stunning simplicity. There are very few rules and restrictions in the game. On a 19 by 19 professional board like this one, each player of black and white stones takes turns to place a single stone anywhere on the board where there's no other stone. And over time, the objective is to surround your opponent's stones and conquer territory in the way that you can see here. The incredible thing about the game is just with these simple rules, there's something like 10 to the power of 170 possible configurations of the board. So what you're seeing here is an intuition of the branching factor. At every moment, there's a further few hundred or so positions, and that goes on and on and on. And to try and place that in some kind of context, 10 to the power of 170 is estimated to be more atoms than there are in the known universe. In every liquid and solid and gas in this room, all around us on our entire planet and in the known universe, more atoms, uh, there are fewer atoms in the universe than there are positions that are possible in the game of Go. So the traditional methods of writing handcrafted rules and heuristics are clearly not scalable. Really important intuition, because many of our world's most complex challenges that we would like to make progress with have the same kind of characteristics. And so thankfully, we were successful in um, playing the world champion at the time at the game of Go. And this was really recognized as a milestone moment in the development of AI. But really interestingly, Lisa Doll, who was one of the legends of the, of the game, who we played originally in Korea a few years back, said something very interesting after the game. His initial assessment going in was that he thought AlphaGo was based on a probability calculation, and it was simply a machine. But when he saw some of the spectacular moves that AlphaGo was able to play, his mind was changed. Surely, he said, AlphaGo is creative. The specific move in reference, he said, was creative and beautiful. And this was really exciting for us because, again, it demonstrated to us that a system through self-play, through interacting with an environment in the way that we had designed, could discover new strategies that were surprising to even the very best players in the world. After AlphaGo, we extended it to what we called AlphaZero. Really interesting that we're able to generalize AlphaGo to be able to play any other two-player game. So we really wanted to resist the temptation that Systems got really good at specific games. Clearly, as humans, what makes us really impressive is that we can learn new skills quite quickly based on our experience of performing well in other domains. So for example, if you know how to ride a bicycle, you're probably going to do a bit of a better job on a motorbike. And you bring that prior knowledge to bear. That transfer learning approach is exactly what we, are, we were hungering after. And so we tested uh, you know, AlphaGo to extend it to a whole bunch of other games, again, learning completely from scratch in a fully general way, with no opening book, no end game database, no heuristics. Um, its self-play starts completely from random, and no reference to any past human games, so purely organically. And the interesting thing is that the improvement rate of the algorithm was actually phenomenal. So AlphaGo Zero had no prior knowledge of the game and only the very basic rules at its input at zero days. Three days later, AlphaGo Zero surpassed the abilities of AlphaGo Lee, which is the version that beat the world champion Lee Sedol, uh, four games out of five in 2015. And three weeks after that, AlphaGo Zero reaches the level of an AlphaGo master, the version that defeated 60 top professionals online and the world champion uh, Kuje in three out of three games in 2017. And then after 40 days, AlphaGo Zero surpassed all other versions of AlphaGo and arguably became the best Go programmer in the world. And again, the key intuition here is that more training time, um, more self-play provides the algorithm and the agent with more experience, more examples to learn from, a greater distribution of possible state spaces. And in doing so, it's able to produce much more general, much more flexible insights. So this single system, this general model, was able to beat the best uh, systems out there in Shogi, in chess in under four hours, and ultimately in Go in under eight hours. It's really interesting here to look at a quote from Gary Kasparov, one of the former world chess champions. He said, the implications go far beyond my beloved chessboard. Not only do these self-taught expert machines perform incredibly well, 
but we can actually learn from the new knowledge they produce. And again, this is precisely the symbiotic um, man and machine relationship that we were hungering after. How could agent systems provide us humans with new insights and new knowledge that we could then use to take actions in our own complex environments and again train systems to improve in the process? And I really want to sort of take a moment to step back because this is really the real purpose behind our core mission to solve intelligence. How can we enable machines to help teach us new insights, new strategies, and new knowledge to focus first and foremost on the problems that actually matter in the world today? And I think what, what's really at heart here is our free choice to work on the problems that really matter and really address the core qu question of what is our purpose in the world today? And there couldn't be any greater moment for us to address these real stuck social challenges. For example, take the, question, the challenge of climate change. We know that global mean surface temperature over the last 150 years or so has been rapidly rising. We know that we're potentially on a trajectory to hit two degrees of rising temperature, which, called, which could cause irreversible consequences for our world and have a massive impact on our ecosystems. According to NASA, the planet's average surface temperature has already risen by about 0.9 degrees since the, last 19th, since the 19th century. I mean, this is scientific fact and is clearly one of the most urgent and pressing problems for us to focus on because the trajectory looks really worrying. A 1.5 degree centigrade average rise could put up to 30% of species at risk of, extin of extinction, according to the IPCC. And at two degrees centigrade, most ecosystems will struggle to survive altogether. But this temperature rise, of course, doesn't just affect animals and ecosystems. Global temperature increases of three degrees are estimated to result in 330 million people being displaced by flooding alone, according to the UN. And in fact, this actually affects all of us right now. Where we're stood here today, sea levels could rise by three foot by 2100. And so take a look at what would happen right here at I.O. This would leave us underwater right where we're stood. Pretty remarkable. So it's clear that climate is one of our greatest challenges. And so three or four years ago, we decided to ask ourselves the core question, how could we as a team start to focus a significant amount of our efforts on this really important problem? And of course, energy consumption is one of the largest contributors to climate change itself. So we, took ourselves, we gave ourselves two core pillars to work on um, at Google. The first is the question of whether we can dramatically increase the efficiency of existing systems, both on the consumer side and also on the large-scale industrial system side of things. Secondly, could we rapidly accelerate the introduction of renewables? We know that this technology is possible. Prices are plummeting. But there are some very significant barriers to adoption that we think machine learning models can help with. So I'm going to talk to you about these two um, goals. So first of all, what did we do on the consumer side? Well, we've had an excellent collaboration with the Android team for over three years now. And what we've been trying to do is extend the battery life that you get from your phone simply by improving the way that your phone interacts with you, the way in a very personalized way. We managed to deliver a 30% reduction in CPU wake-ups. And this is now rolled out to Android Pie, which is already hitting uh, about 2.5 billion users. This had an enormous contribution to increasing the overall battery life from a single charge on a Pixel to around 30 hours or so. So this is a little bit on how it worked. We basically, along with the Android team, built a two-layer deep convolutional neural network with a, fast, with, with, with a neural network on top of that to predict the probability that an app would be opened at a given interval. Um, so the key thing here is that we abstracted out and anonymized sequences of app interactions that you had, and then tried to predict when you were likely to use an app in relation to the other apps that you were using in the future. So we know, for example, that some people tend to use certain apps in the morning, say when you're on your commute or when you're quickly accessing your news. Other apps tend to be used more at the weekends. And this relationship is really important, because if we can optimize which apps stay open in the background, we can obviously significantly reduce the cost on battery life. 
And of course, as with all of the applications and deployments and launches that we try to make, we pay a great deal of attention to fairness and privacy. So there's no favoritism of one app over another. All of that was completely de-identified. You may use a particular app in a very different way to the way I use another app, and that doesn't actually get factored in at all. It's entirely personalized, and your individual usage is what really matters. But of course, we personalize in a privacy-preserving way as well. So all of the personally identifiable data is removed uh, before the actual model is trained, and then the model is retrained on your local device, which I think is a really exciting and promising proof point of how we're going to get closer and closer to locally trained models over the next five years or so. So moving now from processes in your pocket to processes in the cloud, of course, at Google, we have some of the largest and actually already most well-engineered and efficient industrial systems in the world. When we decided to take a look at Google data centers, I can tell you that some of the expert engineers who had been working on these systems for almost two decades now were a little bit surprised that we thought we could make them significantly more efficient. They were very collaborative, and we set about on a three-year journey to see if we could try to use machine learning systems to improve the efficiency of how power is managed in the Google data center fleet. And this is a super important problem, because we're all consuming a, a hell of a lot more uh, of, of data centers' uh, energy and, and um, storage, and we're creating vast amounts more data. Data centers that across the world actually use around 3% of the world's electricity. And of course, it's growing rapidly. So there's enormous opportunity for us here to try and use the existing data and the existing systems and run them much more efficiently. And it turns out that the cooling energy is actually one of the biggest consumers of electricity um, after the non-server load in a data center. In fact, cooling can actually make up around 40% of the total energy used in the data centers. So how did we do this? Well, obviously, everything starts with a large amount of historic training data to give the agent, to give the system some visibility on how the system has operated in the past and try and learn from that and replicate it going forward. So there's over 2,500 data inputs, again, showing one of the many benefits of collecting really rich, really accurate, really well-labeled data over extended periods of time. We were able to look at things like the incoming IT load, power meters, pressure sensors, water flow meters, pump and fan speeds, alarms, external weather conditions, loads of very rich contextual data that provides the agent with a lot of information about how the system has operated. And then we asked the agent to take control of 20 or so actions. So it could adjust which cooling towers are activated. It could adjust how many chillers are being used at what time. It could adjust pressure set points, temperature set points, flow set points, and a whole range of other control space actions. And so the way to think about it a little bit like Atari is that the system is trying to learn the correlation between data at a particular state and a desired action that it's trying to optimize with respect to a specific goal. And of course, that goal was, can we run the existing system at the same, uh, you know, with the same level of performance? We obviously don't want any dropout in, uh, you know, in, in DC uptime and availability. But can we do so with less energy consumed? And so the way the initial version of the system worked is that every five minutes, the cloud-based agent pulls data from some of these thousands of sensors does a bunch of cleaning and processing in the cloud, and then spits back a set of recommendations to a human operator who examines them and then implements them. And this adjusts controls for all the set points that I mentioned. And remarkably, um, this was able to deliver a 40% reduction in data center cooling energy. This is a graph uh, that we first produced when we turned on the uh, machine learning model for about 48 hours and then turned it off afterwards. And again, this was an incredibly significant moment for us a couple of years ago, because it was actually demonstrating that we can do what we attempted to do, what we, what we wanted to do in 2010 when we founded the company, which is train in a Petri dish toy game-like environment and actually extract the lessons from that environment and deploy them in a real world, in this case, in an enormous, uh, very valuable industrial system like Google's data center fleet. But the really exciting thing is some of the kinds of lessons or knowledge that was discovered in the process that was surprising to many of the data center engineers. The first is that it is actually more efficient to spread load across more equipment. 
And so if you think about it as a data center engineer, you're having to review thousands of uh, data center inputs over time, and you've got all sorts of controls that you can adapt. And finding the optimal relationship between different pieces of cooling equipment at different times, given different incoming IT loads and different weather environments, is incredibly difficult, even for the most experienced data center engineers. And so it turned out that spreading that load across more equipment was actually more effective. Another surprising intuition, that higher flow rate through the chillers was actually not always better. In some cases, it remained better. But in many cases, it was actually better to reduce flow to the chillers, given some weather conditions. And finally, adapting the loads to different pieces of equipment across the year turned out to also be a very valuable way to drive efficiencies. So then how did we scale this up and get it into production across the fleet? Well, it was obviously really important that we took a safety-first automation approach. So let me tell you a little bit about that. The first part of the process looked exactly the same. The data center produces a bunch of sensor information that describes state at any given moment. And then the model produces a set of recommendations. But in this case, the model sent those recommendations to a local data center control system that automatically implemented those um, without the human necessarily being in the loop. Um, and this in itself was the first autonomous application that we're aware of in a large-scale industrial system. So some of those key safety features. Firstly, there was continuous monitoring across the entire fleet. There was automatic failover, just in case anything went wrong. There were a set of smooth transition heuristics that allowed the system to gracefully fail rather than abruptly shift to a set of new parameters. There was two-layer verification, so both at the local level and at the cloud level, there was verification of the inputs at both levels. Constant communication between the data center operator, the model, the cloud team, and the local data center team, too. And then crucially, there was uncertainty estimation. And I think this is very exciting. It's the beginnings of interpretability of our machine learning algorithms. You want your model to accurately give you a confidence indicator of how sure it is that a particular set of recommendations are going to lead to a particular outcome that is desirable. And sometimes you might have a bit more courage to move that confidence estimation further to towards the objective that you're looking for in you know, if, if you choose to do that. Or you might want to keep it more constrained depending on um, what you're optimizing for and how uh, risky the state is at that moment. And of course, there's always rules and heuristics, and the human is in the loop all of the time. The interesting thing here is that over the 12-month period that our autonomous system was in deployment, as more and more data or training examples were collected, the performance of the system got better and better and better. In this case, going down is actually a good thing uh, because it's improving the efficiency of the system and using less energy to deliver the same performance output. So it's really cool to see one of the key data center engineers in the team say the following. It was amazing to see the AI learn to take advantage of winter conditions and produce colder than normal water, which reduces the energy required for cooling with the data center. So really helpful to get that feedback. So now moving on to what we've been doing on the wind farm side of things. This was the second pillar of our motivation to try to figure out how we can use machine learning models to make wind much more competitive. The challenge with wind energy is that although the cost of production can, by unit, be lower, over a year it's really, really difficult, principally because it's very unlike fossil fuel energy, and it's very difficult to dispatch. It's very unreliable. So grid operators really prioritize knowing exactly how much energy they're going to receive from different producers and when they need to dispatch that to the various different consumers who demand it at a particular time. And this has really significant economic consequences because that certainty is incredibly valuable. The unpredictability of renewable energy makes it much, much less valuable than fossil fuels because you can't guarantee the exact amount. Sometimes it's windy, sometimes it's not. There's huge variability. So our challenge was to try to improve the quality of our predictions so that we could accurately schedule when we were going to have um, surplus wind energy to, to provide to the grid. And that makes it much more competitive with traditional fossil fuel energy production. 
We started working on about 700 megawatts of Google's uh, wind farm portfolio. This is about a quarter of the entire energy produced by um, Google at any given time. And just to put that in perspective, it's about the same amount of energy that's consumed um, in all of San Francisco. So it's really material. And again, the way that it worked is that we took a whole set of inputs, including whole range of weather forecasts, local weather observations, and all sorts of other data inputs. And we trained the neural network to try to predict, with some probability distribution, what power generation will look like in 36 hours. And that allowed the team to then provide the grid with much more accurate, much more reliable information about when the wind farms were able to provide, uh, provide energy back to the grid, and therefore keep it competitive with the rest of fossil fuels. Just to give you a bit of an intuition for how difficult this is, this is production from 0 to 250 megawatts, as you can see on the y-axis here. And that's just across a 16-day period. So the scale of the variation is absolutely phenomenal. So it's really difficult to make this a competitive product. And being able to tell the grid that we're very confident in 36 hours that we're going to be able to supply you with the right amount of energy that you need, again, makes it competitive. And you can see here that our predictions are tracking the ground truth over time. Overall, this actually made the value of um, the wind energy that's developed at Google 20% more valuable in economic terms. And so again, this is a step change improvement, a really significant um, step up that helps us to uh, you know, eliminate fossil fuels in the grid over time and increase the amount of non-carbon-based energy that we're producing. So finally, just to sort of wrap up and summarize, the intuition I want to leave everybody with today is that we actually have enormous potential to deliver radical improvement to existing systems. Of course, we would love a moment where we could rebuild everything from scratch. But the reality is we have to engage over the next couple decades with old school, industrial, established systems where we have to work with existing data and existing hardware and existing infrastructure. There were no new phones used in the production of these algorithms, no new cooling systems, no new turbines. This was existing hardware. Um, but when we collect the right data and it's stored and processed and well labeled accurately, we actually can deploy machine learning models to generate enormous step function like efficiencies. And I think this is a very modest step forward in the right direction and gives us Good, a good sign that over the next decade, I think there could be really remarkable uh, breakthroughs and advances to come from these kinds of energy efficiencies using machine learning models. So with that, I just want to leave you with a final closing thought. This, to me, is the real power of AI, to help us find really deeply practical, real-world solutions to try and tame some of the complexity of our most difficult social challenges. This is our core purpose, and to me, this is what makes life worth living. Thanks very much for listening to my talk.